Also, everyone, so it's about 5.15-ish. Um, so I figured we should probably stick to our schedule a little bit. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, I'm Nicholas Schweitzer. I'm the media specialist here at uh, SDI um, at the College of Menominee Sustainable Development Institute. Um, and I want to welcome you guys to our comics event. Uh, this is a sort of sequel event. We had a couple of these last year uh, where we brought in some community members uh, to talk about their experience uh, working in the realm of comics and indigenous art. Um, and this year we kind of decided to go a little bit bigger with the sequel as most sequels go. Um, <laughs> So uh, this is, <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, the comics project, also known as the Collaborating Our Model in Contemporary Sequential Arts, is a project that's funded by the American Indian College Fund, uh, and specifically through their community-based Native Arts Learning and Sharing Grant. Um, and as I mentioned, this is sort of uh, aimed to bring knowledge holders into our community to teach us more or so about their craft, um, whether it be art, writing, or uh, the business of how to get into comics specifically uh, with this grant. Um, I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Lee Francis IV. Um, Dr. Lee is the CEO and founder of Red Planet Comics and Books, which is now uh, transitioning into uh, a tribe called Geek uh, Press. Um, I don't know if press is the actual thing, but about the same thing. Um, uh, he's also the executive director of Native Realities, uh, which is the home of the indigenous pop culture convention and Digipop Experience, which is sort of the equivalent of like Native American Comic Con. So it's like all the comic uh, and uh, sort of cultural aspect of it. So it's a cool uh, showcase and that's actually coming up soon uh, next month. Um, Dr. Lee's work uh, revolves around changing the perceptions of native and indigenous people through dynamic and imaginative pop culture representations. Um, he's also a strong advocate for native American youth uh, with a focus in community literacy and entrepreneurship. Um, his works, I'm getting a phone call on my phone right now. You must be asking about my <laughs> warranty, um, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, uh, so uh, Dr. Lee is a strong advocate for Native American youth, uh, spe uh, specifically with a focus on community literacy and entrepreneurship. Um, his works uh, in the world of comics also include Six Killer, uh, which was released in 2018, and uh, Ghost River uh, in 2019, which are just a couple of his works, um, as well as contributions to role-playing games, are also known as RPGs, uh, for the Devil's Rip Run and Avatar the Last Airbender franchises. So I would like to have everyone give him a round of applause, and we will get into this. <laughs> Uh, the same. All right. And I will. Yep. That'll be <laughs> good. Gotten more. I'll try not to as well. Yep. <laughs> Change sources real quick. This will be. There we go. Looks like the HDMI is wrong. Oh, that might. Oh, that would help. <laughs> Wasn't Plug plugged in. in. Yep. All right. Now let's run that again. Okay. HDMI two must be. There hey, it is. There we go. Oh, diggity right. dog. Take it away. Thank you so much. Thought, hey. All right. That's out there. All right. Kwati Haupa, the Wash to Wash Rap, Wahindu May Lee Francis, Washesh Kawaka May, Medicata May. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Lee Francis, uh, also known as Dr. Indigenerd. Uh, my, I guess that's my superhero identity or my alter ego, whichever direction you want to go with that. Uh, my family's from the Pueblo of Laguna, which is about 45 miles west of Albuquerque, New Mexico, right off of uh, I-40, uh, Highway 40 out there. Um, there are 19 Pueblos uh, in New Mexico, um, and we are one of the westernmost that exist out there. We are a cosmopolitan, if you will, in the space because we are located along an old trade route. Uh, and so uh, many of our connections and community connections uh, were around an intersection uh, of a lot of native folks that were passing through there. So from our Navajo, Diné relations, Apache relations, Comanche relations, Kiowa relations, um, as well as multiple Pueblos uh, that were uh, connected through and around us. Um, my background is education. I uh, worked as a K through P20, I guess, P20 educator. So I've worked kindergarten all the way up through college level uh, classes and teaching. Um, uh, I started my career in education about 20 some years ago, teaching at Laguna Acoma High School. So I taught high school and middle school. I taught history and culture, Laguna history and culture. Um, I also taught uh, leadership and I worked with uh, native youth around leadership. And that's really where 
uh, I did a, a lot of the development uh, around education, what I felt was very important in terms of literacy work, pop culture work, uh, and understanding um, what young people are looking for, um, and really focusing on representation, because representation is really, really important in this kind of work, how we're represented, who represents us, but especially in comic books itself. So I'll showcase uh, a bit of my work here um, as I'm going forward, and I can talk a lot about uh, putting together comics, um, because in 2012, uh, I embarked on a, uh, this great journey to be able to make native comics and really to be able to make a native comic book based pop culture company. Um, our goal when we founded the company was to create comic books, graphic novels, games, toys, and collectibles. All the things that we don't have uh, growing up, right? Because we're really saturated with American pop culture, which really focuses its attention um, on the West. And, and when I, I talk about this, I talk about it's, it's a Western pop culture bias where natives really only exist along the Rocky Mountain belt, right? At least in American pop culture. Now we know that's not true because we're here. I mean, there's lots of natives on the East Coast and down South and the West Coast and up. No, we got, we got native folks are everywhere. Indigenous folks are everywhere. But in Americana, if you will, there is this understanding that native identity really exists within this late 1800s Western framework. And so you have a lot of the nomadic tribes, very much highly represented, Apache, Lakota, Dakota. You have you know, the Plains tribes, right? Because they fit this ideology around what native people were supposed to look like. Now, the more uh, you know, settled groups like mine, the Pueblos, uh, you know, and our Navajo relations as sheep herders uh, and farmers as we were out there sort of completed the whole sort of American mythology around the West. Now, a lot of this, this Western mythology comes from, you know, pop culture. It comes from a romanticized understanding of American history uh, and a romanticized uh, conception and misrepresentation uh, of uh, the American identity. Because a lot of people, as they were traveling West, this great vast open landscape was populated with indigenous peoples, our peoples, our clan, our relation, our kin, and it made for really spectacular backdrops, right? So it's cultural tourism. And it looked really, really neat because we already seen all the trees. So we don't want natives in trees anymore. We want natives on these broad vistas and these great plains and these expanses where they're riding horses and you know, doing all this stuff. Now, my people are not horseback people. My people are low to the ground. I am a giant among Pueblos. We are very short people. As my dad used to say, my dad was a, a native scholar and educator, but he used to say, he's like, yep, we're round and brown. That's what we are, right? And, I was, and low to the ground. And I was like, that's great. That's a great way to describe Pueblo peoples. Um, so it, for me, coming from that perspective is really getting involved in comics and the work that I do in terms of writing, uh, managing this company and promoting pop culture, promoting literacy through pop culture um, really has to do with is what I wanted to see. And I've heard this a lot from a lot of creators of color that they didn't have representation in pop culture media uh, in a way that was that was meaningful. Right. Um, and and where we see that really. So with our, you know, our African-American relations, we really saw that develop when Black Panther came out. Right. When Black Panther came out, it was this whole new concept, this whole new identity that they were able to take on being like, see, this is what we want. We have a superhero is amazing, is doing amazing things, technologically savvy and superior in many ways to the people around them. There's a great mythology that goes with it that is a, just a created mythology, but that ties in with African history. You have Killmonger in the story that ties into Black American history as well, and the intersections of the two of those fighting in this story that goes with that. And a lot of the comments that happened after that was, as all of my Native friends were watching it online, they're like, man, where's our Native Wakanda? And I was like, yeah, exactly. This is what we need to create. These are the stories that we need to be telling is where is the native Wakandas? Where are these stories that don't embed us in these representations, misrepresentations and perceptions of native identity that exist in the Rocky Mountain region? Where are all of those stories that tell about our past, our present and our future? Because that's really one of the main keys that I look at in terms of my writing and the work that I try to do is, is around the past, present and future. So telling stories of resistance and resilience uh, survival and survivance, 
telling stories of the now of what our present day looks like and the issues and the things that we face within this present day situation as native peoples and what our future can look like in this bright and beautiful shiny amazing way not these sort of desolate you know uh, end of world scenarios where you know the zombies take over and you know everything is awful you know it's the last of us right you know it's 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 just like oh well i guess the mushrooms are gonna get everybody okay <laughs> That's great. I choose to be very much optimistic. And that really came from the work that I did with my young people. Um, years ago, I was asked, I've served on a number of panels uh, at comic cons. Um, and a lot of the times I get asked about a particular comic called Scalped. So anybody know that comic out there? Have read? Yeah. So I get asked about that all the time as a native person. And I say, this is my response. I say, Jason Aaron, who's the writer on it, is an incredibly good writer. He knows how to weave a story. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, he, 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 he's one of the best guys in the business. He's like one of the chief editors at Marvel right now. Um, for those of you that don't know, Scalped is basically breaking bad on the res. Uh, you know, it's all death and despair and everybody's backstabbing everybody and murdering everybody. And, you know, it's, 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 it's very violent comic. Um, Jason Aaron never set foot on a res, uh, basically just Wikipedia his way through it. Um, you know, the tribal, a chairman is also the casino owner and he's like a dirty casino owner and the cop that comes back is like this ultra violent cop that came back from serving and i was like there are touch points you know and in in our communities there are moments like that but everybody is just awful right it's all anti-hero stuff and my response always with this and i think this has been my guiding star for any of the work that i do in the writing work that i'll talk about here in a second is my students need heroes not moral relativism. We live in shades of gray. We live with very difficult decisions. We live in places that are our home spaces, but in a colonized and occupied state. This is how we live the day to day. My kiddos don't need to see that day to day. What they need to see is heroes and, and, and no shades in there, no decision making. They need their own Superman. They need their own Wonder Woman. They need their own Captain America because that's how they can guide themselves forward. And especially as they're young, because what they see around them every day is not that for the most part, you know, um, it's not to say it's, it's, you know, bad. It's just that they don't see a lot of that kind of heroism that looks like them. What they see is a lot of heroism that looks like other folks, right? And, and so that was what I set out to create. So 2012, we created an organization called Indigenous Narratives Collective. And uh, it happened that I was standing in line in Cherokee, North Carolina, uh, with an amazing comic book creator named Aragon Starr. She writes a comic book called Super Indian. And we were standing in line waiting for food. And I'd known her before that. And I, we were just kind of, you know, we we're just chatting and connecting and all the rest of that. I'd known her online, basically, only. And, uh, you know, we we're having a great time. So we start laughing and we were like, you know what we need? we need a little stamp that can go on books for the called the comics code authority, you know, the old comics code authority. So we we're like, you know, what we need is like an indigenous comics code, like a little label that you can put on, you know, a native comic book that shows that it's like, yeah, it's by for and about native folks. And it's, it's, you know, the community accepts it. And it's, you know, something that's really positively representational. And at this time I'm doing a lot of education work. I was like, that's great. And we're laughing, being like, that's amazing. And lo and behold, a week later, she comes out, she sends me an email and she has this little, she's designed this little label, this little logo called the Indigenous Comics Code, uh, which she still carries on her books. So she puts them on all her books now um, and the work that she does. And it was just fantastic. And that launched this, the work that I do now. The work I was doing previously was really around education. It was teaching educational leadership. And I joke that I got a PhD uh, so that I could open a comic shop, right? Which is what I did, you know? I was like, people were like, yeah, that's okay, gotcha. Well, let's, we'll hear how this story plays out. And it all started in that particular moment because after that, we started having conversations and saying, you know what? We should create our own kind of comic with native creatives that we know at the time. Now, this is 2012, so this is a decade ago. Up to that point, there were really only four native comic creators that were sort of of note. Nice, it finally came up. Sorry, I was gonna show you this. I've been waiting for it to load. So here we go. That was, that was very sweet. That was like, all right, um, I'll talk about this because that's my comic here in a second. Um, so about a decade ago, there's really only four native comic book creators that are working on sort of like a mass cultural scale, a, a big pop culture scale. 
Um, because there are other comic creators, and this is, I'd never want to diminish a lot of the stuff that was going on in the local, in the localities, right? So getting a hold of the stuff that, you know, there were native folks that were doing stuff in their communities that didn't necessarily leave the community or didn't have broad reach. But these four had very broad reach. Tim Truman in 1984 created a comic book called Scout, uh, and he did several sections of that. 1994, John Proudstar uh, created a comic book called Tribal Force which is the first native superhero group. And then Aragon Star and uh, Jay Ochik uh, both came out. Aragon Star did Super Indian. Jay Ochik did a comic called uh, Kagagi, the Raven, based on his cultural characters and creating a superhero out of that. So those were really the only four, you know, comic book creators that had also finished a work, because that's the other thing I will point out here in a little bit, is that they had actually, like, made a full 24 plus pages of comic, right? So a pause. Comic books themselves, I'm using interchangeable terms. So comic books uh, cover a broad range of what we know in this world. I say comic books, I say graphic novels, you say sequential art, there's lots of terminology for it. Um, before it was, I think, the funny books, right? It was, you know, it was, we call them, a lot of the times we call them floppies, right? In the comic book, those are the ones that are, the ones on the tables right now, those are floppies, right? Because, well, they speak for themselves. They, they, flop around, right? Um, and those are usually these little staple bound, you know, kinds of uh, books. Comic books have been around since really the about the 1900s ish to the 1920s. Uh, Timely comics and whatever DC was before that timely is what became Marvel. They were ways comic books as they created and were created were ways to to generate more revenue from a younger audience. Because a lot of these, these companies were coming out of doing magazine publishing. So they were creating magazines. So they wanted to create something that they could draw in a different audience, younger readers, right? Because you're always looking for that next generation of, you know, of people to buy your stuff. So, and they already have the printing presses. So it's very easy for them to shift into uh, finding folks to do illustrations. Before that, uh, before the floppies came out, you had illustrations, you had political cartoons, you had little three panel cartoons, things that showed up in the newspapers. And so you had a lot of folks that came from this, uh, this world of sequential art, but really the first superheroes began to develop in the 1920s and the 1930s. So, you know, out of that, and you have these particular terms, out of that, we have the comic books and the floppies, if you will. Then you have what's called, when they're all bound together, that's called a trade paperback. So we usually, that's, that means that it's, uh, you know, it's, I got an example right here. Let's sneak one out. So something like this is a trade paperback, right? So it's, it's uh, glued on the backside here, contains a lot of the same pages. This is a standard comic book size, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then you have, because a lot of folks were wanting to be like, well, we want to make this a little bit more legitimate, right? And so, and we're not quite doing like superheroes. I want to tell different stories. I want to tell a story about myself. And so then you get this concept of graphic novels. Now, it's kind of important to delineate, delineate a little bit between the two because as a trade or a trade paperback or a bound edition, um, it's still a little bit different than a graphic novel. A graphic novel is using the medium of sequential art to be able to tell a longer story. Now, it was the legitimacy purpose so that it could get into schools as well, right? Because no kid parents aren't going to buy comic books. Everybody looks down on comic books. I don't. I love comics, right? And everybody here must love them because you're all here tonight. So in that vein, they were trying to make it a little bit more legitimate. So you started to get things like, you know, graphic novels, things like Watchmen, uh, like Mouse, like Persepolis. These are early graphic novels that really elevated the form itself. But a lot of those are much more personal stories or they're longer stories. And they really focus on the storytelling aspect and they focus on a narrative that's different than um, say something that's a little bit uh, serialized, right? So this is Superman, or I guess this one's Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen. You know, it tells it in one section, it tells it in another section, it tells it in another section, but Jimmy Olsen's story is going on forever, right? Superman has been going for almost 100 years now at this point. And so it's serialized. And so when you bind these things up, so that's kind of the interchangeables around that. Um, so when, when I started, we wanted to create something for this small group uh, and Aragon Star had met with a number, there was about five other folks that were all gathering at Phoenix Comic Con. And they were all on a panel together. And that was one of the first times they had, had like a native panel, which is kind of striking to think that this is 2012, right? There, there should have been stuff well before that. But this is really the first time they got a native panel together 
in at Phoenix Comic Con, which is also in Phoenix, weird to think about as well, because it's, a, I mean, that's a large population of native people in the Southwest and especially around the, the urban Phoenix area. So uh, we had these conversations and I turned to Aragon and I said, why don't we, out of the nonprofit I was running, I said, why don't we create, a, like, let's make a little comic out of this. So we asked all of these comic book artists and these, these illustrators to uh, submit one page. And they said, just one page. And the theme is, why do you do comics? Like, why, why are you writing comics? Why are comics important to you? And so we had some great illustrators that came along with that. Roy Boney Jr., Jacques Lagrange, uh, John Proudstar, I think, submitted something. No, Ryan Huda Smith sub submitted something. Spider Moccasin, um, Aragon Star, uh, what's his name? Marty Tubles. So we had this really great book um, called, that we titled, INC's Universe. Now, fortunately, I don't have a, it's not on this drive anymore. It's on my drive at home to show you the original cover of INC's universe. But it was basically, I can describe it to you. It was a grandfather reading a, a comic book to his granddaughter. And the comic book, lo and behold, became one of our first, one of our first uh, anthologies called Tales of the Mighty Code Talkers. Uh, Aragon Star came up with that as just a way that she was just like, you know what, I think this is going to be awesome. Uh, you know, what would a grandfather read to their granddaughter as a comic, right? What would, what would this grandpa be reading? He'd be reading about the Code Talkers. So we put together this, this first comic book, slinging it out to everybody. And that was really the start of the company. <clears throat> so right after that, we put up the website, we're doing the whole thing. And that is where the business really got going. Because I finish up, I'm working the end of the PhD, but people are really kind of liking this this comic book thing that we've put together, you know, it's, it's getting some traction. People are really excited about this. And, you know, people are like, yeah, you're, you're a young fella. You know, all the things about the pop culture. How do we get people excited? And I was like, well, I draw, like write comics, tell, tell cool stories, put superheroes into play. You know, that's, that's what we want for our, our native kiddos. Um, so we end up getting a call. And the first time that we go out is to Denver Comic-Con. And at the time, Denver Comic Con was really growing. Right now, it is a it's the Rocky Mountain event. It is a mega event. They get 150,000 people over the course of three days. It's not the same size as like San Diego, which is like I think one to two million people descend on San Diego Comic Con. But Denver was being built. We were very early. I think we got there in year three that they were really building out what they were doing. And the first year, and I always love to describe this as part of the story. The first year we table. How many of you all do any table or craft? Do any like tabling anywhere, right? So you got your table, you throw it down, you put up all your stuff, and displays and everything else like that. Well, we had one book, <laughs> just this one comic. So it's a six foot table and I get there and I'm looking at this and I'm looking around at everybody else's displays. If you've been to a comic convention or you've been to any of these, man, or any type of trade show, right? Big banners and displays and things in the background. And I'm just looking at this being like very humbled at this point, excruciatingly humbled. And fortunately, before I left, I had grabbed some like stuff from the house. So I have like this, you know, like I, I've got this painted uh, hide that I was just like, all right, we'll throw that down on the table. And I had grabbed some pottery. Uh, so my personal pot, I was like, and we'll put these over here. And I was like, hope they don't break. So I'm putting them up on the table. And we take, uh, and then I was just like, I gotta run to FedEx Kinko's right now. And I was like trying to get like images so we could put them on poster boards and like put them up on the front because we really had like nothing. And Aragon was gonna join me and she only had one book at the time as well. She just had put out Super Indian volume one. And I think Marty Tubles was gonna join us and all he had was paintings. So here we are, everybody's got all these books and comics and we have like one between us. So I basically showed up the first day and I just took all of our comics and went, and just spread them right across the line. Like it was like a whole bunch of them, right? And I was like, hey, they're there. And, and because we did it kind of nonprofit, we didn't have a price on them. So we just kind of were just like, pay us like five bucks. It's a suggested donation for a comic. But I think even on the, on the cover, it was like free. And I was like, oh man. <laughs> Fortunately, we were invited and everything was paid for. So it wasn't like having to make money on the event, but it was just kind of like, we could have though, and we could have done, I was like, oh man. So it was really also that was because it was a humbling experience. It was also a learning experience. And a couple of things that I learned at that moment, especially around the business aspect of this was um, really around being prepared for trade shows, 
but also having more content. And that was really the kick in the pants to get more content. And a lot of people came up and saw that Tales of the Mighty Code Talkers. And they were very interested in that. We had a lot of people passing by the booth big because they knew, you know, Code Talkers or the native folks were like, oh, I got code, you know, I, I know some Code Talker folks. So Aragon and I started talking about, why don't we make an anthology out of this? Let's, let's, instead of just having single pages, let's get folks to do eight to 12 pages and put this together, uh, to put this little anthology together. And out of that came Tales of the Mighty Code Talkers, um, which was our first anthology. Um, and, but that took, a lot, that took a lot of time to put together. So now we'll talk about the making of comics. So making a comic is, um, is, is both, uh, it's, it's difficult um, and it can be arduous, but it is also extremely rewarding and it's extremely exciting. Comic books start with a story. All comic books start with a story. And this is what I tell young folks because I've taught young folks who are making comics because um, everybody likes to draw. It's always the illustrators that want to get in and make comics, right? But making a comic really requires discipline because you're putting together 24 to 28 pages. That's a standard size of a comic book. Now you can tell a story in any number of pages. I've written anything from one to 80 pages worth of comic, right? So you can tell a story using visuals, using a visual medium in any number uh, of pages, but the standard size is 24 to 28 pages. That's, that's what you got on the tables right here. These are all 24 to 28 pages. Marvel used to get away with it and they still do it from time to time, but they'll do like, they used to run like maybe 16 pages or 20 pages and then just put a bunch of backfiller in there and it'd be ads and it would be, you know, there'd be just like a whole bunch of extra stuff or they would do like, they'd get somebody from the bullpen to just do like a little four page, you know, whatever, just to kind of make sure that it filled out that many pages. Comic books are always divided into four. So your page count is always fours because that's when you fold a piece of paper in half, right? So you got one, two, three, and four on the backside. So you're always in counts of four, which is also why if somebody writes a 13 page comic, you're gonna have to fill that out another three pages, right? So you always try to write to anywhere, any something that's divisible by four. You can do two, really, because you can get away with that on like a two and you still have like an outside and a backside, but really you're writing in fours. So uh, when you put a comic together, always starts, it starts even before the story, I guess, but really it's the idea. What do you want to talk about? What do you want to go into? When I do activities with young people, I often, I often start with like create a superhero for your community, right? So when I'm working in, in spaces like this, I say create a superhero for your community. What would that look like? But let's get deeper. What's their superhero name? What's their powers? Where do they live? How do they work on a day-to-day -day basis, right? What are they doing for, you know, how do they make money? Because a lot of the same time, that's how most comic books start. Think about Spider-Man, you know, starts with Peter Parker, right? He's this, you know, kid from Queens, you know, and he's sitting there and what does he do? He works for the Daily Bugle as a stringer photographer. You know, he's a student when it starts, uh, you know, and so doing classwork and then, you know, taking pictures and all the rest of that. So that's kind of, you're, you're building out a character out of that. And Stan Lee, when he was putting it together um, uh, with Steve Ditko, and they were creating this character called Spider-Man, you know, they were just like, okay, so then what happens? So he has powers. So he's got super strength and he can do webs and he's got this other thing. So how did he get those powers? Now you start looking into that origin story. So, so how does he, how does it, how does that happen? Well, Oh, he got bit by a radioactive spider, right? Which gives him enhanced senses and super strength and speed and dexterity, kind of like a spider. Oh, okay. So when I, when I work with that, I say, okay, so what kind of stories? Okay, so then he's got villains. So what is he? Okay, so he's just, he's, he's not a guy that can handle things on a global scale. He's a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. He works around his neighborhood. He tries to stop, you know, robbers. And, and then he has this whole tragic backstory with his uncle Ben, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. That's his mantra for life that, you know, play, you know, so now he's got all of these components and that's usually what we start with. So when I'm working with young folks, you want to start with something. Okay. So in your community, I'm like, who, what, what is the superhero? What are they going to do to help the community? What do they want to do in this space? Who are they? Who's their family? Super Indian is written very much like that. Uh, Arrogant Star came at it because she wanted to write uh, you know, she writes a little bit more satirical and kind of poking fun, using the character to poke fun, but 
uh, if I recall, it's Leaning Oak. I, I may be wrong about that, but her main character ate tainted government commodity cheese uh, and gained his superpowers from that, right? So Superman style. And is like developing his powers now over time. So, you know, I think it starts with like super strength, but always trying to help out the community from those that are trying to exploit the community. The first one I think is the anthropologist is trying to come at him. It's at the library. You should go see, you should go check out the books downstairs. So you can go see, you know, um, and, you know, and so she battles that. And then the next one uh, in the next uh, volume battles a character named Blood Quantum, Blood Quantum. He's a vampire uh, that is cursed by Aztec folks uh, and needs to suck the blood of, of full blood Indians in order to like gain his status to become a full blood Indian himself and remove this curse. So she writes in this satirical way, but she creates these characters in this wonderful, uh, you know, uh, community, right? So she had an approach, she had these characters. Another char guy that wrote like that is uh, Theo So, um, who wrote Captain Paiute, which was one of our early publications. Um, we helped launch that um, with Captain Paiute number one. And Captain Paiute, uh, the defender of the Southwest has water-based powers um and you know uses them to defend the Paiute people uh because the, the reservation where uh, uh Teddy's from is right outside of Las Vegas so then you get all sorts of great stuff that come in from there of like all the scheming in the Las Vegas you know folks that are trying to come and take the water and so for people in a desert water-based powers tend to be very active right um I get a lot of that when I'm teaching these classes with young people I get a lot of water-based powers um, bringing rain, bringing water to the community, right? Um, so we start with that story. And when I work through those stories for me and my process is I like to do adaptations, but I also just start, I'll just start thinking about what, what kind, of, kind of story do I want to see? What are the stories that I like to read and where do they come from? And, and how do you make a character as something interesting with that? So I'll point this out right here. So this is Six Killer. This is the first full comic that I did that I wrote for 28 pages for. Um, and it is the story of a native woman seeking revenge for the murder of her sister. So I had the idea for this comic because this actually, uh, the first idea for this comic was an iteration. We wanted to do something around Alice in Wonderland. Uh, and I was like, why don't we do like a native Alice in Wonderland? And I started talking to Roy Boney Jr., amazing Cherokee illustrator, artist, um, just a sensational guy. And he and I were kind of, I was like, hey, I got this idea. Why don't we do like a, like a Cherokee Alice in Wonderland, right? Like a native Alice in Wonderland, we'll set it in Cherokee country. And we start going back and forth. It's like, ooh, there's some really great parallels. I mean, because they have the, the you know, Chistu, which is the rabbit. Um, the Mad Hatter can be Sequoia, right? Like, because he's got the turban. And then you have the, the uh, what is it? The caterpillar can be the Uptena, the horned serpent. And there's a lot of there was these great little parallels. And I was like, oh, yeah, we could totally do kind of a version of that. And right around the time we were putting the draft together, the Violence Against Women Act came out and did not include Native women in it. And it was something that was really, it was such an affront to me. And I thought to myself as a writer, you know, because I'm watching everyone, and I was like, oh, I can just, I'm going to go online. I'm going to say stuff, you know, and I'm going to just, you know, because that's what we write. And I was like, no, it's just like, that's, that's, that's too short. It's too short in the memory. And there's a lot of amazing people that are doing amazing work that are already writing about this and they're doing policy work and they're working hard. And I said, what I wanna write is I want to, I wanna write a character that kind of puts the fear of God into those that would hurt native women in my community. And I'm not Cherokee, so I have, I'll talk a little bit about that. But in terms of like, that was super important to me. And so the story began to change. And so Alice Six Killer is a young woman um, that has, you know, uh, some mental issues uh, in her life. Uh, she's a big fan of Alice in Wonderland, but she blurs these uh, boundaries of reality and what we'll call the dream time, right? So where things are real, but not real. And, and, she, and she operates in this space. And for her, it's, she, you know, it's not a thing where she, she recognizes what's going on, but it's not something that causes her panic or anything else like that. But she's going on this, She's going on this journey uh, to, to seek revenge uh, for the murder of her sister as she put this together. And I got an incredible artist, um, Michelle Yalvitre. This is the first thing we work together on. And it starts right here. So I borrow a lot from Alice in Wonderland. The preface is all in a golden afternoon. So if you, if you are aware of Alice in Wonderland, the book or the Disney version, this is the song that they sing, all in a golden afternoon. It's like at the beginning of the thing. Um, 
And so she's kind of doing this voiceover and, and she says, my sister read to me at night, there was this one poem I memorized and you know, uh, it's a childish story taken. So this is from that part. And so you see these aspects, you know, this is what we call in, in, in any vernacular and media is called the cold open, right? So they do that on Saturday Night Live. They do that, it's that first little teaser in before the, you know, before the masthead comes up, right? So these scenes of violence um, that move into uh, this, uh, and then this is kind of the lead out, and this is chapter one. So it starts with a story. I wanted to say something about this, but I want to weave a narrative. And if you're planning on making comics, if you're planning on doing any type of this, the thing that catches people is, is the narrative that you're going to tell. You can talk about anything you want to, but there's a balance between finding something that's meaningful and something that becomes pedantic. And for young people, this is where I learned because of my time in education, there's a lot of stuff that we give to young people that is very pedantic. And people think it's great. And I don't want to dismiss the art that people or the work that people put into this type of space. But it's not something that I, the kids that I know, and many of you that are out there that work with young people, are going to go back to. I want to create a story that young people are going to go back to time and time again. That is always my goal for the work that I do. A lot of the stuff that comes from educational spaces is, you know, it's like, don't, don't do drugs, kids, you know, and don't for the kids that are out there. But all the time we hand you a comic and it's like, it, it tells you, it's just like, oh, it's terrible. It's all the rest. But I don't relate to the characters because I don't know who they are. So what you're writing is something that's informational rather than something that is more meaningful because you can write about the topic and still make it meaningful for somebody that's going to find that um, and be able to draw from that. There are numerous times and numerous instances uh, that I've been at Comic Cons and listened to people talking about how comics change their lives because they found solace, they found representation for themselves, they found people that maybe looked like them but were, were going through the same things or they just drew, uh, they drew inspiration from Captain America or they drew inspiration from Iron Man. I'm an Iron Man kid. I loved reading Iron Man because I love technology. And anytime he changed, he was the new armor. And what's the new stuff in this armor? That's cool. That was really exciting for me. I think that's why I'm all technology, my whole family's, I'm the IT guy for the house. So everyone's like, can you fix this? I was like, give me, I got it. Um, so, so you start like that. Now for somebody like me, I am a writer and it is difficult being a writer in a comic book industry because you always have to rely on illustrators. Uh, and sometimes the illustrator you want to rely on is busy, they have a job, they need money themselves, so they can do labors of love, but you know, they also, those labors of love don't necessarily like move very fast when it's not a job. So you, I am very much at the mercy of illustrators when I'm creating comics. It's a lot easier when I'm doing other things like writing for role-playing games or writing just straight, you know, novels or other pieces like that. Um, it's a lot easier to be able to do that. But you essentially sit down and you start writing. And the writing is organized. Uh, the way that I write is that I organize it by, I do just a general overview. And then I do a page by page breakdown of the action that's gonna happen on each page. And then you break that up into what we call panels and gutters. And so each one of these pages, if I was showing you what this looked like on the written page, what this would be is panel one and panel two. There's two panels on this. And I use panel one essentially as a full page splash Panel two is an inset. Uh, and that's how, I, that's how I would write this out. Uh, and so you have to start thinking as a writer when you're writing the comic, you have to start thinking about the spacing. Now as an illustrator, it's a little bit easier, but sometimes the illustrators that I work with don't take the time to write the stuff. They just go right into the drawing and they're just moving the drawing along. But it is really, really important to have that outline because it keeps your, the, the consistency in your narrative, page over page, and how you wanna do the layout um, and then there's tips and tricks, you know, you're working with your spacing and whatnot, and you're working with your pacing in the story. It has a lot to do with the way that you place things visually. And there's cool things that you can do. You can go horizontal, you can go vertical, but essentially you're going to be writing about six panels per page. That was the old standard is a six, six panels per page, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's how it would work. That fits really well. You get a lot of action in six panels per page. So I often think about it in six panels per page. Also, as you build your action, it's very easy to write in those spaces of a six panels per page because your first two are your setup, your second two are your build, and your third two are your, 
you know, your connection, your, your climax, if you will, but really it's what's going to tease somebody to get to the next page. And so as a writer, you're always thinking about how am I going to get you, or as a writer, I am always thinking about how am I going to get you to turn the page and not just be bored with the comic where you're just going to look at me like, okay, this was great. Moving on. So that's my role and that's my job. So working with illustrators, you send it out to an illustrator. <clears throat> the illustrator starts by doing pencil work. So you got some great examples back here. You got the sketch work that needs to go out first and it's called thumbnails. We do it, we call it thumbnails or sketches where they just kind of map out what it's gonna look like. You figure out the pacing, you figure out the design uh, of how the comic can work, work itself and work through it, right? So that's the first stage. Then that has kind of a talk through and approval stage, you're kind of going through, making sure that it all works all right. And then you go into the full pencils. That's when it starts to look really good. You can see, I think some of the corner uh, on this same one back here, you can kind of see that it's going from thumbnails to pencils down in the right-hand corner. And you get to really, now they're really starting to fill in the pencils. You're making some really concrete decisions. You move from pencils into inks. Inks are really important. Everybody who's seen Chasing Amy jokes about, you know, oh, you're a tracer. Uh, kind of, but inks bring everything out. Ink, this is ink work. This is all ink work right here, black and white. Inks really make everything stand out. It gives you depth. It gives you, it solidifies everything. So this is going from pencils to inks. You can see that over there, right? Um, and then uh, if you're going to keep it black and white, this is about where it stops. You may add some little background details, but you start filling in some of the colors. So coloring comes next. And then after that, you lay your letters over that. So I do a lot of the, the lettering too for all of the comics that I've done. So all this lettering here, this is all my work. I do all the lettering in my comics. Um, one of the reasons why is I, I like to have editorial control at the end of the day, which means I can make changes uh, in, if I don't like the way it's you know, framed or it's too wordy or I wanna get more to the point, I'll make changes on the fly. Um, Stan Lee used to do that. He was notorious for doing that to his artists. They'd lay something out um, and it used to drive Jack Kirby crazy about this at Marvel because Kirby is just an amazing illustrator, also an amazing story writer, but Stan Lee also knew how to appeal to an audience. And so he'd get something across his desk and then he'd go in and make changes like at the last minute. And it used to drive Kirby crazy because he was like, that's not my words. That's not what I wrote down. And, and Stan Lee would be like, too late, it's done, it's out, out already. Um, there's some really great histories that you can read about that. You can read the unauthorized history of Marvel Comics, fantastic book, um, really goes in depth around how Marvel got structured and all the things that happened. So after you do that, uh, you lay, you put your letters in and then you do your graphic design work um, because you can put all these pages together, but then you have to put them into a book and you got to make sure that book all fits and you got to do margins. There's a lot of technical aspects that go with this. Um, this is what we see over here is basically standard comic book size. So what you see on the table, this was set um, because it actually scales out. So if you take this size that's on the table right now and you scale these out, it scales out perfectly to 11 by 17. So it allows comic book artists to be able to work on a big 11, a poster size canvas, an 11 by 17 canvas. This size scales down to what's a, it's 6.625 by 10.25 inches. That's the actual size of a comic book. But it has this also natural scaling ability because if you want to get smaller, it naturally scales down to six by nine. So this is sort of a medium between 11 by 17 and a six by nine. So you put all these pieces together, you put your wraparounds, and then you take all this stuff and you send it to a printer. Printer sends you back the pieces. If it's gonna be stapled, if it's gonna be perfect bound like this, you always have to be aware when you're working in something like this, that you gotta keep that little space in the middle because it's glued. So you can't push stuff out to the edges. And I'll tell you, I learned that the hard way. So when we first got started, we produced a comic book um, that uh, I was not as adept at graphic design at that time. Did not know a lot about margins and bleed. So when we sent it off to get printed, there was a lot of text that was right up against the edges of things. And a lot of that text got cut out. And that became a comic that I couldn't really sell anymore, right? I'm not gonna ask somebody to pay five bucks for a comic that like they can't read, you know, five pages of dialogue. So that became a great giveaway and a great learning experience, right? So margins are really important. Gotta be aware of how you tuck your text in. Also learning very early on where to place text and how you gotta, you have to, 
work with your illustrator in terms of page placement. If you have something with a lot of text, because you get to be writer heavy, you go through and maybe the end it, but you've created a scene where there's a lot of action happening. You're not going to be able to have both in the same space at the same time. Right. So these were all early things that I learned and a lot of things that I started passing on to groups saying like, be aware of your placement, be aware of how you're spacing things. Don't put a whole bunch of stuff in one space. Also remember that this is a visual medium. And even in the storytelling with a visual medium, you don't need as much words all the time. There are great moments when that works and it's awesome when a characters can monologue and go in and there's, but that means that the art then has to space itself out. So lettering and placing lettering is an art in and of itself. And the, the artist, the illustrator also has to know placement to be able to work with that. So for example, if I'm doing three panels, one, two, three, and I've got a lot of text on those panels, that means the artist needs to give me enough room where the artist has to give themselves enough room to be able to place the text and still keep the visuals for that, right? So um, as we move forward <clears throat> with the company, we really wanted to, I, I, uh, we did several sort of runs. One of our early uh, anthologies was an anthology called Dear Woman um, that tells the stories of native women uh, in survival, uh, empowerment, resistance, and healing using traditional character, the traditional character of Dear Woman as like an avenging spirit for native, woman, native women that are facing sexual and domestic assault. That came from Elizabeth LaPonce and some of her work, uh, her illustration work and her writing work, as well as her own personal experiences and how she found healing in the work that she was doing. So she took a cultural character and was able to move it into this comic book format. Shortly after we did an anthology with her first, and then we said, you know what, we should probably go and like, let's make an anthology of this and let's talk to other native women to tell these stories using their traditional characters or traditional healing that they can bring into this and tell more stories. So we put out Dear Woman. Uh, we finally got done with the Tales of the Mighty Code Talkers anthology. Anthologies take a lot of time. When you're working with multiple artists and putting that kind of stuff together, you are at the whims of the artist. And I talk to people about this all the time. We've been working on, com we've been working on a comic for two years with the University of New Mexico under the Red Planet comics banner um, called Johnny Geronimo, uh, and it's a native noir, native detective story. And the illustrator has a day job. And so it takes forever to get this done. And it's not necessarily the illustrator's fault in any way. It's that this kind of thing, and especially for the amount of pages, it's like 96 pages. It's four, um, it's four stories. So all of them about 22, 23, 24 pages. So like 96 pages. A standard illustration, a good illustrator can really work without a lot of detail, can work about two pages top to bottom a day. So this is really the, it's kind of the standard, right? So about two pages a day. Marvel does something really interesting. The industry does something really interesting where they do, they do a thing called stacking. So what they'll do is the writer gets two days to write. You got to have your script done in two days. And I've talked with some of the industry guys about this. So if you work for the industry, and anybody that wants to jump into this, if you're going to be a writer, you'll have two days to put your work together. This is 16 hours, essentially. You get one day to draft your outline and do your framing, and the second day to put all of your panels and pages together and get ready to send to the illustrator. The illustrator then, if you're running 22 pages, the illustrator has 22 days. And if they can get a page and a half done a day, they cut that time down. As soon as that page gets penciled and comes off the line, it goes right over to the inker. So they're stacking it so everybody's about a day behind because in the industry, you're trying to get a book out per month. So you have 30 days to do 28 pages, essentially. In the meantime, somebody's illustrating the cover, which is why you don't see a lot of the inside folks doing the cover work because cover, cover folks, one, cover folks is a specialty because you wanna make sure that the cover pops. It's something that you want people to see when you're going to the store. Um, and that is absolutely something that anybody can jump into. Cover work is amazing. So if you're really good at just single pages and not running a whole story, cover work is the best way to go with that, right? But the cover artists will start doing stuff. The graphic folks will already start putting together like the masthead. So, you know, your, your title, all the stuff that goes in there, all the internal pieces, all the advertisements, all of that's going on simultaneously that the illustrators is working. The anchor comes in, as soon as the anchor is done, because they get a day to get that page done, it goes immediately to the colorist. 
And the colorist is already working on that. As soon as it comes off the line with the inker, uh, really around the penciler, it already is starting to be lettered. So by the time you get done, industry-wise, you have four people, five people all working on this simultaneously. And as a writer, you're off writing the next book the next day because you're probably handling four titles. Um, some of these guys are, I mean, Jonathan Hickman, uh, who is the editor-in-chief right now for Marvel, is writing something like seven or eight titles. He's also the, um, what did he do? Hickman did, um, oh, I can't think of, uh, he's done a bunch of stuff, but you can look at a bunch, you know, um, The Walking Dead. Um, that was not Jonathan Hickman, but, uh, you know, you can look at The Walking Dead. Same guy was also writing Powers at the same time. So he's doing The Walking Dead and Powers. Um, and, you know, I mean, like, these are heavy books. And he's just constantly, these guys get into a rhythm and they're just kind of constantly churning the stuff. So that's the industry perspective. When we start putting stuff together, we try to stack as best we can, but really it's on the whims, not the whims. It's on the, the ability, the skill, the timing that the illustrator has to be able to put everything together. And that takes a lot of skill uh, you know, and a lot of management. We put together at this point, four anthologies. So Howell, which I'm gonna show you right here which is our most recent one. Uh, we have, I don't know, this was a, just a boatload of people. <laughs> That's all I remember. I was like, and trying to keep everybody's name straight. I want to say there's probably 40, 40 people that were a part of this, writers and illustrators across the board. And then we have some interstitial art in the back. But Howl is really fantastic. Um, it's an indigenous anthology of wolves, werewolves, and rougarou. Um, Fantastic stories about identity, fantastic stories about our wolf relations and our werewolf relations. And they, they range from uh, uh, death metal werewolves from outer space uh, to uh, we have sort of like little kawaii uh, werewolves in the back. Um, you have a whole thing that's, you know, werewolf around kind of like police violence. There's a whole awesome werewolf story that was show you Alvitre and Stephen Graham Jones, the amazing horror writer, uh, native horror writer put together. So I would have, we have, we have some up here, I think, forgive me. So uh, this is a fantastic uh, book. We'll have this in the library as well, I believe. Hmm. So a lot of this began, um, so we put together a lot of these stories <clears throat> because we wanted to tell these stories about native heroes, essentially. So Dear Woman comes out, Tales of the Mighty Code Talker comes out. Uh, we, put out uh, we put out Six Killer. In the meantime, we do things like this, where you have some really cool narratives called Native Entrepreneurs. To, it's basically we, or I wrote, and Dale DeForest illustrated uh, based on the work of Catapult Creative um, and the entrepreneurship that was going on uh, out in Pueblo, Navajo territory, so in the Southwest, um, around people doing cool entrepreneur things, right? But I bound it up in a narrative of this time traveling native woman genius, uh, uh, you know, and talking to her kids about all these cool native entrepreneurs and the cool things that they're doing in their space, right? And then we have some. Uh, you know, the lesson plans and some other stuff in the back there, right? Um, but it tells all these stories. And these are actual stories. So we took these stories and we turned people into comic book heroes. And it was, it's really been, it's so satisfying when you get that moment to be able to present it to the person and be like, that's you. And somebody's like, I'm a comic book character. And again, it goes back to that whole point about our representation that we like to see ourselves in things, even just as humans, but especially as native folks, to be able to see ourselves like in print, it is memorialized in many ways. So we took on projects like this. <clears throat> and then uh, we have the great fortune to be able to uh, work on a project called Ghost River, which is, we wrapped that right before the pandemic. Um, tells the story of the 1763 massacre of the Conestoga people outside of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And I was telling earlier how the Library Company of Philadelphia brought us out and what we ask for from people that are gonna be working on things that are not, you know, uh, uh, like in their own communities, right? This is an external, this is the library company. It's non-native to the hilts out of downtown Philadelphia. It's the oldest public library. It was founded by Ben Franklin. You know, now it's an archive, blah, blah, blah. Uh, is that they, they came and said, we want to have a native illustrator. We want to have a native writer. Uh, we want to have a native publisher. We want to go into community. We want to have native consultants. 
and we want to make sure that we do this right historically. So I got the gig because Wishoya was illustrating it and she wanted me to write it and I was going to publish it, but she was like, well, why don't you write? I, I would like him to write. So I said, okay. So we wrote this story um, and it's another one that I, I, I wrote it. So I would highly recommend it, but I would also recommend it because it's a way that we can, uh, that I like to work with storytelling, especially from a native perspective, is it's non-linear storytelling, right? Because, so it takes place in multiple time spaces, including the present. There are moments where I included myself as a character and we show you as a character to be able to um, reflect on what we were seeing in the archives and to show like our thought process of creating this comic while also talking about the comic. Because a lot of the times in, when you do historical work, and especially with Native folks, and especially around these moments of tragedy, it's very hard not to get mired in that tragedy. Um, and it's, and it's very, it can be filled with despair and sorrow. And I choose, I particularly choose not to write from a, a place like that. So these moments of introspection, these moments of healing, um, often are in all of my, my work. And in the work itself, you also see a lot of resilience. So I don't end my any of my books with native folks, you know, um, like dead on a battlefield. It's always living native folks today. So the end of Ghost River is native women that are looking down with the trees behind them, kind of like at this like pan up, like they're looking down at a camera, right? Um, and this idea that here's the river, the river is still flowing, the people are still here because we continue to be, you can't push it on there. <laughs> it's awesome, just straight, that's fantastic. Here, wait, wait, here, hold on, hold on. And go back. Oh, I can't get my mouse. Okay, there we go. No, it's not going to pull up. Okay. So, so even in this, uh, so I did want to point this out from Six Killer because I think this is important for me to write about or to talk about. And I've talked about this um, in some um, interviews and articles. This page right here, and I'll kind of scan back a little bit. Um, when I wrote it, I wrote it in a way because I was writing this cold open and I wanted this really compelling image. Um, and the original image is the sister murder, right, on this. And my wife is a social worker. Um, she's a therapist uh, and a rape crisis therapist. And so I was showing her because I had just gotten, I had gotten the book, you know, I'd gotten everything from Wishoyo and I passed it on to my wife. And she says, this is great. She says, I would have stopped reading right here because the original image was much more graphic than this and much more violent than this. And she says, you're an amazing writer. And I had been on the fence about it to begin with. And as a writer, sometimes you're writing in your head and you know it's gonna have that pop, but you, once you see it on page, it takes something, it becomes something completely different. And it also was something that I, you know, the, the idea that in my head, it looks great, but I also have my own sort of moral compass in the way that I write is I don't want to see dead and dying Indians on the page. I don't like to see violent acts against native people. In Ghost River, we are very deliberate around not showing that. We don't show native people getting hacked or murdered because I was like, That's an, there's enough of that. We've already seen that in the Westerns for decades. We see that in things like Wind River, you know, uh, in, in, in the cinema all the time, right? And I'm like, I'm, I don't wanna see that anymore. And I broke my own rule. And so it was great that I took my wife. So then I contact Wishoyo and I say, how do you feel about this? And she's like, that page was excruciating for me to draw. And I was like, you are a champion, A, B, let me know. Like, you know, and we were still kind of developing our relationship. So we didn't quite know. I mean, we had just started working together on longer works. So I was like, you know, and not entirely her responsibility either, but I wanted her to feel comfortable to let me know that in there's things where she felt uncomfortable, she could trust that I would take that and receive that. So I said, you know what? Let me go back to the drawing board on this because I think we can do this better. So what I did was we took it apart into these two pages where we took the original image and did a shattered mirror, um, shattered glass effect over here between the two. So you can still make out some of the pieces on it, but it doesn't come together as such a um, violent image um, and a triggering image. Um, and so that was one, whenever the work that I do that's, both cross-cultural or cross-gender, I make sure that I go talk to people that are associated with this. So this takes place in Cherokee country. I ran this by three Cherokee folks that I trust. Roy Boney Jr., uh, there's a Cherokee woman that I work with 
uh, and a third Cherokee woman that I also had reviewed this before it even made it off our desk. This at this space right here, I was like, if we're going to go back to the drawing board, now's the time when we're actually at the drawing board. And I always do that. And also getting women involved because I write women characters. I am a big proponent of that in my writing as, as well. I want to make sure that I have women represented because Native women are very rarely represented in pop culture media, except for two, which I talked about in the class earlier, Pocahontas and Sacagawea. So those are the only two that show up in, in, in media. Uh, so I like to have Native women represented. So I always work um, with Native women on this space. So I know we're getting close to question and answer time. I just wanted to show some of you, I was talking about it earlier. This is my next comic book that is coming out. Should be out, I'm hoping next month or two. Uh, still waiting on the artist to get all the inks done. Aha, ha, ha, ha. So waiting on the inking, but this is one of those ones where coming off of Six Killer, which we're still working on, trying to slot that in when we show you has time for issue two. But in the meantime, I still like to write. So this is the new book called Cindy Coyote Trickster Extraordinaire. She is the daughter of Coyote and a native woman here from Wisconsin. And uh, basically it is, um, think Buffy the Vampire Slayer meets Veronica Mars set in Indian country. Um, <laughs> so she has, she basically has, you know, a Wolverine style healing factor. And she has taken on the mantle of being the daughter of Coyote. She's a demigod in some ways, right? Like the Greeks. And so she goes through and she shows by action to her colleagues who are gonna do terrible things. So the cold open for this one has a whole bunch of kids that are gonna climb a water tower. She goes and climbs the water tower instead and then falls off the water tower, busts herself all up, traumatizes the kids. They all go screaming, running away. And you know she kind of leaves that thing. She says, don't worry, this happens all the time. And so as we see, this is something that she does kind of night after night uh, taking care of her community and, the, and the, the people around her community, but she doesn't want to let her mom know. So she has to keep it hidden from her mom. And she also has to keep hidden that her dad, Coyote, who her mom has been just like, get out of here. You're not part of our life anymore, right? So Coyote is gone because he's such a rascal uh, in the stories. She also knows she's been communicating. Her dad comes to her in the dreams and you know, she's like, thanks dad, really appreciate it, right? Um, in the meantime, she discovers that there's this whole world of elder tricksters and monsters that exist. So the world that we're creating around this is a world where monsters actually exist in the space, um, in this world that we live in right now. Uh, and so all of these, and so she is having to be a high school student as well as fulfilling this role as a trickster um, and as well as trying to navigate her mom and also not being killed because she finds out that the elder tricksters that she's not quite as immortal as she thinks she is. So uh, that should be coming out. So be on the lookout for it. Uh, we'll, we'll get that over to the library, I would presume at some point. So, um, so that's a, a bit about the process, a bit about our business, how we put things together in terms of comics and a lot of the behind the scenes of what I try to do with my writing what I try to put forward into the world and what I've done with my company with Native Realities, um, with the Indigenous Pop Culture Expo, which will be in Oklahoma City next month, uh, which we did when we opened Red Planet Books and Comics, um, which we did close the retail side, but you can still find us online, um, is creating these worlds where Native kids get to see heroes. They get to be nerds and they get to enjoy that, that nerding out, making comics, reading comics, living in these wonderful fantasy worlds, continuing to showcase their communities to write, to inspire. Uh, and hopefully that's what I have done with a lot of my work and what I will continue to do with my work uh, moving forward. So I will leave it there. And I think we have, we can open this up for some questions for another 10 minutes or so, if there are any questions. If not, I'll just take a nap. I took a nap earlier, so I'm good. Yes. Hi. He's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Right. 
It does. I was telling stories about it here just a little bit ago. And a lot of the times, you know, for us, because we're in a visual medium, oftentimes people stop at the cover. Um, and it's one of the big issues with comic books is that you put a cover out and people lose their minds. They don't read it where they'll find like one image that is like, oh, blah, 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 blah. you know, um, that happened with Dear Woman. So we had a woman that reached out to us that was just irate about the book. And I was like, why? And she's like, Dear Woman is supposed to be beautiful. And the way that the, this is drawn on the cover, it is, this is it's disgusting. It's ugly. She's ugly on the cover. And I was like, it's a particular art style. So Jonathan Thunder, Jonathan R. Thunder, who does the art for Dear Woman, at least the, the cover in the anthology, it's a very deliberate sort of line-based style that he uses. Um, it, covers, it covers kind of the way that like, you know, that Beth LaPonce really wanted to, it to, to be explored. She picked him specifically for that. And I was like, well, have you read the book? And she's like, no, and I won't because uh, this is not the way she's supposed to. And I was like, but it's really, I mean, it's important. I think it's a very important story. So more often than not, I try to be, as an educator, I tend to try and be very gentle and delicate in aligning folks to, to give folks context. So especially around like Indian jokes, you know, um, contextual context around colonization and what that means, why writers are writing the way that they are. So if you read, um, you know, you can look at The Marrow Thieves, um, uh, Sherry Dimeline's amazing book, right? That native, the, the uh, native bones hold the key to solving like some global pandemic. And so natives are being hunted for their bone marrow, right? Um, incredible book, incredible dystopic, uh, you know, award-winning masterpiece, right? It's, you know, uh, there's some folks that are just like, <gasps> you know, that, you know, they, <gasps> it's the stuff. <gasps> um, and so it's, it's kind of walking folks through, like, this is, this is where the, the, the writers approach and understanding, like, if you're, if you're going to talk about Sherman, you can talk about Louise. Erdrich and her work as well, there's a lot of stuff in there that people can get offended by in those spaces. And so it's saying like, well, you know, some of the issues that she has in, I can't remember which one, but you know, it, instances of uh, sexual assault, sexual violence that go on. Well, it's saying like, well, it's very prevalent in Indian country. This is important for her to write about for a wider audience, but also for herself as a writer to represent where she's coming from. So you know, I think that that's one when it's non-native audience, when it's native audience, it's also, it gets, I won't say stickier, but there is also having to be very uh, respectful in terms of the pathways. I had, I was giving a presentation to our um, all Pueblo Council of Governors. So all 19 governors get together for a meeting. And there's a really great artist by the name of <laughs> Jay Garcia. <laughs> it's like a bunch of great Pueblo artists, Jay Garcia. And he does these really cool mashups of like a Pueblo woman in traditional dress. She's got like her, you know, like her headdress and she's got her traditional manta and everything else like that. And she's holding a Starbucks cup, right? Well, the governors didn't, didn't like that very much. And I'm trying to tell them about pop culture and the importance of that. The governors are basically, they're just like, yeah, that's blasphemous. We don't like it. And I'm like, so having to be just very gentle and generous uh, in my approach, you know, particularly of saying, well, one of the things is that this is how he sees his daughters, right? They're going to go do, they're going off to ceremony. They're going off to the dances. Well, they stop at Starbucks on the way there, right? There's one where he has another young woman and she's thinking about Pokemon, right? Uh, so it's, and he really works with these juxtapositions of native culture, Pueblo culture, and the cultural things that we see in mass media and what's kind of really going on, right? These are kids. These are kids that are affected by the media around them. So I think in that sense, the work, it has to be, I mean, anybody can take it the way they, they want to. And I got all sorts of ranges of friends, but for me, I want people to try and understand it better. So I always try to find pathways and give as much context as I can. And I know that's hard a lot of the times. I'm not saying everybody has to do that because it's not everybody's responsibility to educate non-native folks. I mean, that's a hard thing, right? Like, it's just like, man, why I got to spend all this time? Just go read a book, you know, <laughs> go read Indigenous People's History of the United States. And I'll be over there being like, I got it right here on the shelves. I'll sell it to you, you know? Um, but I think that even at, even at the shop, I had to do that with folks that would come in and talk about, you know, uh, I had folks come in and be like, 
you know, why, why don't, why won't you carry my, I got this one a lot. Why won't you carry my book? I was like, are you a native writer? Look, look around, you know, I was like, you're not, we, we just native writers on the shelves. I'm not going to carry your book. You can get, there's a great independent bookstore right down the road just for you. Right. So, and I was like, and you're probably missing a lot of context in your book because you have native characters, but I'm pretty sure you didn't go talk to anybody about it. So there's a lot of that. So I think that that's, I mean, that's my strategy more often than not is, is, you know, I try to provide a pathway for folks um, to be able to understand the context. I don't write for them though. Very similarly. I was like, I won't, I write for my, I write for native kids. I write for my community. I write for y'all basically. I want native folks to have heroes. So I'm going to write, I'm going to write like that. So that's where I'd kind of draw a line. I was like, I'll tell you all about it, but I'm not going to change who I'm writing for. So thank you. Yes. Yeah, it works a little bit of both ways since I'm, so for me, I will do a lot on paper. I'll, I'll sketch things. So even for me, just for like pacing, even though I don't draw, I don't illustrate, I will often sketch out pages before I start writing them or just trying to get like what I want for pacing. Um, so when I'm thinking through the panels, I was like, do I want six panels? Do I want four panels? Do I want a full page spread? Also, it helps me when I send those pages off to the illustrator because it gives them a better sense of what I'm looking for. Because sometimes it's hard to put into words when I'm trying to move fast that I want say like, a so like trying to describe it, I, I had this at one moment, was basically like a pixelated fade of an image down the bottom of the page. So it starts out as like a full Im image and then it becomes like little squares that kind of pixelate all the way down. That's kind of hard to describe to somebody. So what I did was I grabbed like an image that I could show somebody was like, this is what it looks like. And then the artist had that. Stephen Graham Jones does that as well. And his stuff is just immaculate. Like he's such a great comic book writer. And when he wrote, um, what was it? Uh, Memorial Ride. Uh, and we were working on Memorial Ride together. He put in like any time where he wanted a particular visual image, he put in like the, what he wanted it to look like. So he grabbed comic covers or comic pages and embedded them in the document itself so that the illustrator could know exactly what he, he kind of wanted out of that particular scene. Um, so I'll, I'll work like that as a writer and I'll put those things in. So most of my work, I, I type, I type faster than I write by hand. I'll do notes and ideas. And then I go straight, I go straight to the computer. A lot of the illustrators that I work with have varying styles and it oftentimes depends on the amount of time that they have to get things done. Dale DeForest works almost exclusively. No, I know he works exclusively digitally. So he has a Wacom tablet. He does everything digitally. He can manipulate things faster that way. Um, the majority of folks are a mix between what they'll start is they'll do pencils on paper and then they'll scan it in and do color, ink, and, ink and colors uh, digitally. Cause it's a lot easier to do that. Um, if you need to make changes, colors saves the world if you're doing colors digitally. Uh, coloring by hand is, a, is an immense amount of work. Um, and I will attest to that because Wishoyo did that for Ghost River. So everything that you see, I don't have a copy of it here, but we'll get a copy. If you see it is everything that uh, she did in Ghost River, she did by hand in watercolor. Um, and if you see it, there's one particular page because all I wrote in the description was downtown Philadelphia brick buildings. She drew every single brick by hand and she joked about it online. It's an amazing piece of work. Like it is absolutely. And she joked about it online. She's like, I hate brickwork. <laughs> and I remember responding being like, I didn't ask you to draw every brick. We just, you know, like you could shorthand and she's like, no, I'm not taking any shortcuts. Um, and for her as the artist on that one in particular, because she had the amount of time and the resources, they paid her very well for the job, the amount of uh, time and the resources to dedicate to it. She did everything with like, she did everything by hand, inked everything by hand, and then used traditional pigments from the 1700s. The colors that they would have used back then, she did watercolors with those. So she did watercolor wash with everything. But I would say that that's really a rare case. That's when you have, and that's an art project as opposed to say a comic, right? Most people are gonna work really, really quickly digitally. And the, and the, the younger generation is very, very much digital now um, just because the speed in which they can work. And they're really good at it. Like I watched a young woman that we work with. She, they got li like little gloves so that it doesn't, their your hand doesn't stick on the tablet. And she's just, so she has, it's like, it's got like a glove with like two fingers and then these, 
these three are open. And then she just got her little pencil. She's just going to town and making changes and moving things, and making changes and moving it on and making. And I'm like, that is just, it's in, insane. And they just move so fast. It is amazing to see young folks that are doing comic book work. If you are, I just, I love watching it. It is, it is such a, a delight. So yeah, that's pretty much the process, process wise. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that was, that was the one. I think I might have a picture. I might, I do have a picture of that. Let me see if I can get, find my mouse. Come here, little guy. Oh, I don't know. There we go. You know, open recent. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so this is the cover of Ghost River. Yeah. And when you see it, the inside. Whew. So I also like to start off my works with um, usually like from, especially something that's historical. I like to start off my work from a, like a traditional, usually with a traditional story or traditional introduction of some sort. So this one, we started off with the Lenape creation story um, because we were doing historical work. So we were telling the story of the Conestoga. They're very, they were very close uh, to the Lenape community. They fought, they intermarried. There's a whole bunch of stuff prior to the, you know, the 1700s. Um, and so she did this piece. I, I, I'll see if I can find it, not on here, but I'll see if I can find it because we need to, we're just about over time, uh, is um, she did a piece of the creation piece of Turtle Island and how Turtle Island emerging from the sea with the trees growing on turtles back. It is stunning. They have it at the library company. They, they were just like, we own this. Now, like they have kept that in their permanent collection. It's one of the most beautiful pieces I've seen. I'll see if I can find a picture of it here in a second, but I'll let these chaps do their thing. We'll say one more question. Okay, one more question then. No pressure. Yes. Whew. Ooh, I go into the future. I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a technologist. I'm a futurist. I would absolutely go into the future. And I hope when I get there, it would be native Wakanda. I swear that's exactly what I'd be looking for. And maybe it's all in the multiverse or whatever, but that's like, you know, my, I would just be like, oh, we planted some seeds right here in this moment. And I would get to see how they develop. It's interesting being a teacher over time, how that happens too. If any of you are educators of seeing students return and seeing how they've, you know, what they've done with their lives. It's really lovely. I had, I was up giving a talk in November at Amherst College um, in Amherst, Massachusetts. And two students that I had just given a talk like this to came up to me. One that was there at the opening day of the shop and one that I had talked to at uh, Sherman Indian School in Riverside, California, like six years before at that point, it was because it was pre pandemic. So I think it was maybe four years before because it was 2018. I had gone out there to do a talk and she's like, I saw you were going to be here. I remember when you came to visit us. And that was just such a really cool time jump that like, I was like, well, that was neat. Wow. Somebody actually like remember me. And that was, that's kind of cool. I like fan, fan, fanboyed out on her. Like it was just really neat. So that's what I hope for in the future. I would definitely jump into the future. And where's my flying cars? <laughs> Let me see if I can find this. You all do your thing. I'm going to try and find this right. image. And go. There we go. So here's the image. And by the way, I'd, so if you want, and we'll get, we're trying to get the book for the library, but you could also go to ghostriver.org and download a copy. If you go to ghostriver.org, one of the cool things about this, this is one of the things that we worked with is each one of these little sections has maybe like this little eye and it opens up video about the, uh, this is an interview that they did a whole little mini documentary with myself and Washoyo about putting the whole thing together. So ghostriver.org has all this stuff up online so you can download a copy and then you can see all the cool stuff that's on there. But this is the work she did, the main piece, this is you know kind of split because we had it at a fold in the book, but the main piece is probably about this big. And she did, she did most of the work in just like this huge scale, um, two 11 by 17s. Uh, and yeah, this is one of the most amazing pieces I have ever seen. 
So uh, I will pick up the evaluation. Yep. Oh. Stay on the table. Yep. Uh, if you have your evals, uh, keep them on the table. We'll make our ways around. And pick them up. Food home, please. Oh yes. There's so much. Please take some home. <laughs> um, definitely have lunch and dinner for tomorrow. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, I think definitely that's uh, in suit. Let's give Dr. Lee a round of applause for presenting. And oh, yes. And as a thank you for doing this, uh, we have a gift bag of goodies from SEM. Uh, so, yeah, so there's a lot of cool stuff in there. We got some, uh, well, we got Frisbee in this. Thank you. All right, that's it. That's it. Okay, cool. And just a reminder, we will have more of these events throughout this month and next month. So keep an eye out on the SDI College Menominee Nation and the library Facebook page. We will be keeping you updated. So we'll end and thank you for coming. Drive safe. Thanks,